I can already tell is from his letter. But uh, anyway, so Richard, would you open it for us, sir? Father God, thank you for the opportunity and privilege that we have to come in your name, gather in your name and worship you as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Father God, I pray that you give Pastor Jack the <coughs> words to say, give us hearts to receive uh, whatever you would have us to receive. And meet each one of us wherever we are in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, sir. A couple weeks ago, or was it last week, I mentioned that I got messages from Africa and some of them were kind of mad. And they, they asked me uh, about how do you know the false gospel from the true gospel. I'm not going to attack people. I'm not going to go for anybody. I, I like what the video said last week. I'm going to try to crucify the prosperity gospel. Yes. Because it needs to be put to death. And I'm sorry, we export that to people in, that, one gentleman in particular in Africa that is, I'm sending this to another guy in India, another guy in the Philippines, and the Philippines are just deceived too because there's a lot of uh, Islamic faith and then there's a lot of Catholicism that does not really break the person to repentance and faith. They, they don't understand the gospel. That doesn't mean that Catholics are not saved, but I'm saying that sometimes they get the method mixed up with the message and make the religion without the relationship. And that's, that's what I've been doing for a long time. And I've decided it's not about re religion, it's about relations. I don't think God wants any more religious people. He had enough of them in stomach full of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and it made me sad, you Amen. see, because I don't want to be like that. But I was a lot like a Pharisee. And it's kind of like our hearts are bent toward craving things in the flesh. It's like C.S. Lewis said one time, and I'm like this too. He looked at bacon and eggs and he committed breakfast in his heart. Okay. <laughs> Our hearts are deceitful and we lust. And so the prosperity gospel plays on that natural flesh, carnal nature of people that uh, makes them susceptible to it. He says, I want more of this. Well, you know, if you looked at the authentic and you looked at the... Uh, the I would say the unauthentic, or I say it another gospel, there's a gospel from hell. And I know that sounds pretty strong. But he, Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. And if you don't have the message of repentance and faith, you've got, you're against him. So for the gentlemen that are trying to train pastors or uh, into the missionary field, I'm going to send this to you, how you can compare the authentic with the synthetic. Maybe that's a better description of it. One thing about the gospel is the gospel uh, preached, uh, Christ brought, and John the Baptist, and Peter, and John, and Paul, and James, all of those, brought a, uh, a, the need for brokenness. Yes. And the prosperity gospel fills with, we ain't broke, don't fix it. We empty ourselves of pride here. Here, there's nothing but pride. It's just opposite of the spectrum of brokenness in faith. One of it is that they, they, we want to glorify God. I heard that a lot this morning in our Sunday school. They want to glorify themselves because of what they've gained. We have prayers of faith. They ask for seeds of faith. And I spell seeds with a, with a dollar sign. That's how I saw And And their prophets are uh, prophets for profit. And so we pray for his will. That's what I want, his will. They pray for God telling them their will. You know, by bless me and I'm, you know, they're making God out to be a quid pro quo. Like if you scratch my back, God, you need to do this for me. That, that robs God of glory. We are content with little. They have discontent with little. Yes. That's a difference. That's a huge difference. Yes. You know, contentness uh, with little is great gain. They think great gain is contentment with God. They've got it all wrong. They could not be more wrong. I would consider myself a man of unclean lips. If Isaiah said that, you know, he said, he said touch, take the coal off the altar and touch my mouth. I'm a man of unclean lips. I think we all are. They say, they've got a miracle in their mouth. And so see the difference? They, they've got miracle or powers word in their mouth. We've got unclean lips, let me tell you. That's the truth. Yes. It makes me mad. 
We humble ourselves before God and, and before others because I've confessed to you what my background is. You guys know. They exalt themselves before God and man. They equate wealth with godliness. They are exalting themselves. Godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, I think that is. 1 Timothy. For them, great gain is godliness. They got it opposite of what it is. Does that make sense? Yes. We are serving God, and they are serving mammon or money. There is no other way about it. That's why they, they are filling them. And, and I believe this is becoming the new enemy, the religious people. We've got a narrow path. Not many are going down there. Their path is the broad path, Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Broad is the path that leads to the, the way of destruction, and many there go in it. But few are those that are taking, taking the right path, and there are not many going in there. It's like trying to go shopping on Black Friday, and you're trying to go out, and they're coming in, and it's stampeding by nature. So I'm going to look at this using the scripture, uh, Titus uh, chapter 1. Titus is uh, kind of mentored by Paul. And he also uh, did the same thing with Timothy. I think he brought these, these men up in the faith and, and pointed them to Christ. Uh, and he, they, he refers to himself as a spiritual father to them in the sense that uh, he, he was able to lead them to faith in Christ. And I, I never lead, I lead people, uh, I try to point them to Christ, but God is the one, the Spirit actually leads them to Christ. Okay, We can tell them about Christ, but, but Christ actually does, uh, the Holy Spirit does the convicting and the saving. So... I read this and I thought, you know, this is spot on. This is how you can tell an authentic gospel from a synthetic gospel, which is the gospel. Satan's got his own ministers, and they're out there. And they're, probably, they're outnumbering us now. It seems like they're outnumbering those who are preaching repentance and faith and, and turning away from sin. And they don't even want to mention sin because it might uh, offend them. So in, in Titus... Chapter 1, I'm going to start at verse 9 and see if you can see if you can see why I'm putting this. And I want to apologize for the nations. Uh, we're the number one exporter of false religions now, of false cults, uh, of easy believism, of uh, health, wealth, and prosperity. We are the number one exporters of the world. And, and it's just like we are we're poisoning the gospel. That's right. And, and there are, and, and it makes it lethal. Part of the reason I'm doing this is evangelism. Because if they're going down after somebody or following a man and, and pursuing wealth, he's letting them to hell. I want to rescue them. The reason I'm doing this is to, to try to pull some of them back and show them, if you're not hearing the real authentic gospel, get out of there. Run, Forrest, run. And you will look at the differences of the two and don't look back. <clears throat> Titus 1, verse 9. This is a command of Paul. Paul is telling Titus, be holding fast the faithful word has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort, to convince the gainsayers. Convince would be a better word is convict. I want the Holy Spirit to convict those who are hearing this message and are trapped and caught up in this health and wealth and prosperity to stop and look and hold fast, cling to, don't let go. It's the same word that uh, Adam clung to his wife or, or a man should cleave to his wife. It's the same thing because we want to be, uh, we have to hold on to it because a lot of the world has let it slip through their fingers and they've turned it into another gospel. To convict the gainsayers of uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 9, the gainsayers. You know what that means, that gainsayer? I don't know what your translation says. But it would be like me trying to go up to Las Vegas and I, I already know I can make money on this. I've got this, I know what the score is going to be in the Super Bowl before the game even starts. I already know the score. I know what's going to turn out. Zero, zero. Zero, zero. The game hasn't started. See how a game, that's, I'm trying to gain something by slick presentation and deceiving people. Don't, don't let you, be fooled into thinking that they are really not knowing what they're doing. He's trying to exhort and convict, is a better word, the gainsayers, 
Those are false preachers. The gain is for gain. They're saying things for gain. Do you see how that's an old English word? It's a compound word. It, it, and I'll show you why I can say that for it in verse 10. There are many. He didn't say a few, and there's just a small minority, but there's a few back of it. No, he said there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers Especially they of the uncircumcision. The uncircumcision or the, oh, I'm sorry, the circumcision. Those are legalists. Okay. It could be one extreme. You're legal and, and you can join our church if. Or in the other sense, you can't join our church if. So if you don't follow this or this set of rules or you don't go to, you know, we observe the Sabbath and blah, blah, blah. And, or the other one is, is, uh, is no law. And it is one extreme to the other. There's somewhere down the middle that we want to find. So, Titus 1, verse 11. This sounds pretty strong because if I went up to somebody and I heard, if I visited one of these huge churches and I, and I went up and spoke to the man and I interrupted him, hey, verse 11 says, your mouth's got to be stopped. Mm -hmm. I'm, I can't do it physically. He's going to call security. So what I'm going to do is send a message to other people that might pick up on that, might hear the true message and allow that rebuking, exhorting. Uh, you use the Bible, the Word of God, to cut. And it does cut. And I'm going to let it cut. Whose mouth must be stopped. Who subvert the whole houses. Now here's what they're interested in. They're teaching things, verse 11. What's the ought to teach? For one thing, they may not be teachers. They may not be gifted to teachers. I think we have a lot of gifted teachers here, by the way. But you know what? They, they're teaching things, verse 11, they ought not, for what reason? Filthy lucre's sake. Modern translation would be dirty money. Okay, they're doing it for money. Here, here's Paul's point to Titus. They gotta, I want to shut them up. I'm going to try to crucify the prosperity gospel because they're doing it for filthy money. It's not, that's the only reason that they're motivated to do this. You know, you, I notice you don't ever find anybody counterfeiting gum wrappers. It's not worth very much. They counterfeit the real thing. They try to counterfeit money. They counterfeit those things that are valuable. What is more valuable than this? Yeah. And they also hit upon the emotions, uh, the, the needs of people, uh, so they are they're kind of using and abusing the gospel. In verse 16, they profess that they know God. And I hear that so many times, do, you know, do you know God? Yeah, I know God. Well, I know the president, but if I walked in there, then they're going to arrest me. But, but I know the president. Then does he know you? That's the question. Very bad. People say they profess. That's why I like that. Verse 16, they profess Christ but they don't possess Christ. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, depart from me. I never knew you. He doesn't say, Do you, did you know me? Do you know me? Yes, I know Jesus. That's not the question. Jesus says, do you know, does he know you? That's the bigger question. People get that mixed up. Do you know? Now, that, that's a big point because you can profess to know God. Congratulations, you qualified to be a demon because even the demons believe. So you're in good company. No, not so good company. To believe doesn't mean anything. I can believe in gravity, and if I jump off a building, I'm going to die. You know, that doesn't mean that it changes the law or that it uh, thwarts the, the power of gravity. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. In what they're doing, they deny Him being abominable and disobedient unto every good work. And here's the word again, reprobate. Reprobate, it, to me, means you have no judgment. You're void. And if you look at the word, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say devoid of, or void of judgment. You can't, they're, they're just can't use a, a good judgment. And the Holy Spirit gives us good judgment to be able to discern truth and error. The more I'm into this, I'm going to just be able to discern error. And when I started finally coming around, uh, there's a... a this guy, let's see, Robert wrote me a letter, and he's already wanting to uh, learn more. He's hungry. He wants to learn more. He listens to Charles Stanley. Uh, he listens to Dr. J.B. Jeremiah. Uh, R. Uh, R. Uh, some of these guys you may not even heard. He is listening to some very good, solid teachers. 
And he's already discovered that, you know, what, what I was hearing before was not really the gospel. I said, that's wonderful. And How can you know by placing it against the blueprint of truth? And that, that's how you'll know. So that's kind of a, an overview of that. I'm going to turn to uh, 1 Timothy. There's a, uh, something special about when somebody, and I, I do the same thing when I'm, my mentor is, is Dave Powell, a retired pastor, the former pastor here. And uh, I've got to be honest with him sometimes that, well, I should be honest with him always, but let me clarify that. I've got to be telling him things uh, about myself, confessing those to them, confessing our faults to one another uh, so that we, we might humble ourselves. You know, the more that you confess your fault to others, the more humble you can become because you've got nothing to brag about. And he goes, you know, that makes the other people that hear that think, you know, that makes me feel better because, you know, I did the same thing and I lost my temper and I kicked the dog, you know, whatever else it might be. So, it, it is funny because... Uh, I've, I people that lose their temper and they lose their cool, and I says, you know, it kind of, I kind of blew it, and I'm sorry. You know, I told my wife a couple weeks ago, I kind of, I didn't kick the dog or cat. I don't have a cat, and you can't hit the cats to move it. But the thing is, I lost my temper, and I didn't slam, I didn't break anything, but I kind of went thumped on the table, and I was really mad. And my wife went in there, I apologized to her. So the transparency is that I confessed to her that I was wrong. I shouldn't have did that. That's not very Christ-like, and I'm really sorry for that. But what that did is humbled her and says, you know, it, we all do that. And, and you know, it, it makes you, uh, it makes it more understandable because all of us are like that. So <coughs> yes. having said that, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to go through the first four verses of 1 Timothy 4. For some reason, I had trouble finding Timothy. Timothy is to the left of Hebrews, and to the right of uh, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Sometimes I get lost. And it, you know why? Because that book is not in the proper place chronologically. It should be near, it before the first, second, third John. And that's where it should sit, the way the time that it was written. Because this was, first and second Timothy were the last two letters that Paul wrote. Not that Paul, but the different Paul. Now the Spirit, verse 1, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit, Holy Spirit is speaking to, uh, to him right now. Expressly or specifically or exactly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. That's happening. Giving heed to seducing spirits. That is happening. And doctrines of devils. Anytime you see the word devils in plural, it's demons. Okay, there's only one devil. Okay, thankfully, there's only one devil. So demon, devils is just a way of saying demons, you know, collectively. Some will depart from the faith. They give heed or listen to or take uh, as truth the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what that gospel message is. Uh, it's another gospel, which Paul says is no gospel at all, actually. Verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, that's a good that's a point where they reach to a point where they're trying to bilk people out of money after a while they have no conscience about it. One lady that I heard about was disenfranchised from this uh, prosperity message God preacher. She made out her a living will and testament in uh, there was a thing that she bequeathed this to the, to the church. And uh, her relatives fought it because they didn't believe in the guy. And this was a false teacher. And so they kind of fought it. And, you know, they realized that, that when it went to court, they actually said that the preacher was promising her things which, were never, which never happened. And it was like false advertising. And so they, he used lies and deceptions to get her to leave her will for this prosperity uh, church. And the judge overturned. He says, you know what? I think you're right. The guy. So there we have legal evidence. The guy's a liar. Yeah. I mean, is that any more clear in a court of law that the preacher, the prosperity gospel preacher, was lying to that lady because they said that here's his words, and this is what he actually delivered. Nothing. He made God promise her something which never came to pass. So actually, we have a legal precedent that they are liars. 
Now we don't need a legal court to say that these men are lying, but they, but they are. But I thought that was interesting. 1 Timothy 4, verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, back to legalism, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving. Didn't he say uh, when, the, when the sheets came down three times before Peter, and by that saying, declaring all cleans, uh, foods uh, clean, you know, that... So I don't understand how they get, they get off on the other one direction. I used to belong, one of my first churches I belonged to was a Sabbath church. And it was a seventh day Sabbath church. And after a while, they made you feel like if you weren't there on the Sabbath, and they began it on Friday night, Saturday, uh, sunset to Saturday, and that's the Jewish sun, uh, the way that God reckons time. And they wanted to do it at the same time. And I thought, you know, I'm never going to be, be able to fulfill all that they're requiring. And I felt like after a while, a, a little French <coughs> poodle jumping through hoops. I said, this, something is not right about this. It, it's an external obedience. It's, it's like, uh, it's not an inward conversion. You, we accept you because you're doing this. Nice boy. Like we, I was joking, Paul. Stay, Paul. Stay. Sit. Good boy. Roll over. It was kind of like that. That's what I felt like. <laughs> and are you going to scratch my belly? I mean, it was like, what's next? I had to get out because when I started reading some of the things about, uh, like I just mentioned, that Jesus said, and this here, I was like, you know, something's not wrong. That's only because I was able to discern because of uh, knowing the scripture. It wasn't anything superior in me at all. Verse 4, for every creature or uh, everything, every created thing of God is good and nothing to be refused. It's to be received with thanksgiving because it's sanctified. And uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to jump off track and this just kind of popped into my head and I'll show you why why the mega churches are growing so fast. This might explain to you why. I'm going to turn to John 6. I didn't plan on doing this, but it just kind of put, <coughs> hopefully the Spirit of God put that in my heart. John 6, and I'm, I don't want to start, verse 47. And I'm not sure why. This is the gospel right here. This is the, this is the gospel. You can't buy it. It's priceless. You can't afford it. John 6, 47, I most assuredly I say unto you, he that believes on me has eternal life. And I believe that. God has promised us eternal life. I don't doubt that. God can't lie. Okay? Are you with me so far? I am the bread of life. In fact, I'm going to use some of this uh, next week for the uh, Lord's Supper. It might surprise you. Part of what I'm going to use. Uh, I've never used this before. Uh, this chapter. He's going on in verse 15, 51, that I am the bread that came down from heaven. They knew what he was talking about. They were thinking in the wilderness, the bread that came down from the heaven, and manna, you know, the word manna just simply means that, what is it? You know, they went out there and looked at the manna, and manna's got a special name, and they know, it means, what is that? Bread of life. He is the bread of life. I will give, the, uh, will give my life for the life of the world at the cross. That happened, John 6, 52. That this way the Jews strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That was offensive to them because they knew that eating flesh and the blood and human, that, that's sin. But Jesus is trying to separate the sheep from the goats. So stay with me. Jesus said unto them, and this is really going to offend them, unless you eat my flesh, Eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood. You've got no life in you. Verse 56. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. That to me sounds a lot like communion or the Lord's Supper. Is it not? The bread in, in His blood. By the bread and the wine. Or the grape juice in this case. That's a key right there. I think there's something hiding in there that we may... I've never seen it before. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my cup dwells in him, in me, Jesus says. And I in him. See how that... 
It's, it's this calling to seal our believing in Him and dwelling in Him and He dwells in us. The contrary is this. And I'm not sure where Jesus, He said it in this chapter. Whoever does not eat my flesh and whoever does not drink my blood has no part with me. You see how communion is one of the sacraments that Jesus commanded for us to do? That's why I like to do it uh, more often, if at all possible. Jesus said, that's the bread that came down in heaven. Not as your father's ate, temporary, had maggots in it the next day, had to be eaten this very day. John 6, 58. Not as your father's ate in the manna, in the wilderness he's talking about, and are dead. Okay, they ate it, they're dead. Didn't work for them. But he that eats the bread, this bread, shall live forever. And, and this is amazing, John 6, 59. These things he taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. He's teaching this where the Jews worship. I go, what in the world? Can you imagine? He comes in and you're invited to guest speaker. And let's say I got invited down to Joel Alstein's church and, and I'm going to get up there and speak and thank you for inviting me here. And they're not going to invite me back. I'm sure of that. It would be like me taking the prosperity gospel and the crucifying on stage live in front of everybody. They're not going to let me do it. So that would be like me going up there preaching the real gospel of repentance and pointing to the Mr. False teacher over here. You know, if you looked under his turt tail, he's got black wool. He's a black sheep. And he's a wolf, actually. That's not sheep clothing. That's wool. So he taught these things in the synagogue in front of the Jews and then kind of in the temple. Can you imagine that? Now, synagogue is not the same thing as a temple. It's just different worship places. Uh, they had their own temples in different places at synagogue. Many, and here's, here's my point, John 6, 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And what he's saying is, can you hear what he's saying? I can't take that. that that's just not right. Because remember, he is where he is at. And I'm going to close with this part here before I go back to uh, Timothy. Jesus knew in verse 64, there's some that are not believed. Jesus knew from the beginning who was that they believed and not and those that, who should betray him. Therefore he said that no man can come unto me except it were given to him by the Father. That's a John 60, 40, 644 also kind of says the same thing. That you can't, you know, uh, you can come to Christ and say, well, I found God, and by the way, he was not missing. You know, he calls us. You know, it's an arrogant to think that we sought God and we seek God and we found him when he was never lost. He called us. So, uh, I would put it like this. He, he, he sought me. He caught me. He bought me. He taught me what I ought to be. Found about me. Key. Amen. So, that gives him glory. Yes, I wouldn't be here. I'd probably be, uh, I'd probably be taking off Super Bowl Sundays too if I did not. You wouldn't miss him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, or, oh no, wait, I'm back up. From that time, verse 66 of John 6, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They're done. Some that are going to go to the prosperity gospel are going to stay. But when they hear the true message of the gospel of repentance and faith, they're needing to turn away from sin. They're going to leave. Many, it's saying, many of Jesus' disciples, when they heard that, they said, that, I, can't, I, I can't take that. That's just so contrary to what... But he was willing to risk it. And I would say, if many didn't go away, and many followed Jesus, he might be thinking that he wouldn't think that it worked. <laughs> There's something I'm not telling them. There's something missing. I'm going to go back to 1 Timothy, and then I'm just going to probably stop at this 1 Timothy book because of the uh, amount that I have to give it to go, to go through. It's just, it's just a little bit too much. You know, if I was going to write a last letter, like 1 and 2 Timothy, it kind of like his last will and testament in his last letter, <coughs> So, um, 1 Timothy, <coughs> Timothy.
with these six. Sorry about that. It is time to almost buy a new Bible. <coughs> 1 Timothy 6, 2 through 10, and I'll probably close with this. <coughs> and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather, or sisters, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, 1 Timothy 6, 3, and consent not to all some words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine, and this doctrine, which is according to Christ, guess what? He is proud. He knows nothing. But dotting about questions and strife and words where come envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. In other words, these are just what pouring forth evil things out of the heart. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing, 1 Timothy 6, 5, supposing the gain is godliness. And I'm telling you, if you are being taught in a church that that godliness is great gain, from such withdraw yourself. Or get out. Get out. That's what that's saying in verse 5. But, godliness, verse 6, with contentment is great gain. They've got it just the backward. They've got it just the opposite of what it should be. For we brought nothing with us into this world. And guess what? There's no U-Haul behind, you know, at a hearse. It's not going to, you can't take it with you. But you can send it in. Yeah. But we brought nothing into this world. And it's certain we can carry nothing out. And you know what? If we have food and raiment or clothing, we can be, it's content. We're content with that. But, verse 9. They that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and that temptation and snare are used by <coughs> false preachers to snare, like an old trap. You trap a bird that's trying to fly, and it's flying, and it's free, and it grabs it, and it brings it in, and it devours it. Like that Paul said, in devouring widows' wages and earnings and raping the poor and disenfranchising people by robbing them They, they that be rich are falling into temptation and a snare and into many foolish, stupid, I would say, hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Here's one of the verses that is most taken out of context, one of the most oftentimes. It's just the love of money is the root of all evil. No. The love of money well, let me say this. The loving of money is a root of evil. Okay. But the love of money is the root of all evil. Not the money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is, is at the root. While some coveted after they have erred from the faith. That's what they want them to do. They're straying, they're erring. The word for err is being seduced. I have all the, almost all the time, sometimes, frequently now, people are trying to bring me down by, by sending me emails about, do you want to meet, you know, and have you, would you look at my pub, my pictures, and nasty, normal, horrible. It's just trying to get me to click that link. I'm not going to do it. If I don't know who you are, I'm not going to answer the email. I'm not going to answer it because I've had too many. Fortunately, I have a good uh, protection, virus protection. But what, what they're doing is they're trying to seduce me, just as the false prosperity teach are trying to seduce you yeah. so they can go through your wallet. Yep. Basically. Yep. You know, while they pat you on the back, they're reaching for the wallet. I mean, that's really the, the brutal truth about it. That's the way that's right. it is. 
They have been seduced from the fruit of faith. The way that 1 Timothy 6.10 reads, they've been seduced. And their money has been reduced. And the promise of seeds will produce. But they pierce themselves with many sorrows because you know what? The paper, uh, the money trail is an endless, futile thing and it just brings nothing. I want to close with two more verses. Hey, I'm going to turn to 2 Timothy. Imagine this. I'm, I know I'm going to die and I'm going to leave your free will testament and I'm going to leave out a will and it's going to be my last letter and I'll send it to you all so you can all read it here. And uh, ask you not to share it on Facebook, but uh, this is like the, the last living testament of Paul, Second Corinthians two. So, Paul, do you have any final words? Yes, let me write this second book. So that's what he did in Second Timothy, and I'm going to start with chapter two, verse twenty-three through twenty-six, and I'll end with these because after this, uh, it's just going to be easier for me to end at this point for this reason. Second Timothy 2, 23 to 26. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid them, knowing that they do not gender strife. I don't want to debate with an argument. I don't want to cast my pearls before swine. That's part of that is what he's saying there because, you know, how many angels are going to fit on the head of a pen? It's a useless question. You know, what, what we want to do is the verse before that is to call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Those, that's a very good question. But verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, and I would say unto all women, apt to teach, be patient. And that patient we talked about in our Sunday school class, and meekness, instructing those that oppose, uh, that are, those that are opposed themselves. If God pre-adventure, or, or in case God will give them repentance, to the acknowledgement of the truth. So that's why I'm, I pray for them to come to repentance and to see the error of their way and to, that probably doesn't seem likely, but, uh, and finally, verse 26, that they might recover themselves. Or it, the, the way the Greek uh, they, says that they might be taken alive, taken back, taken alive from him, from the day, Satan. Because he's got his own gospel. He's the God of this world, that he's blinded the minds, that they won't see the glorious gospel. So Paul is wanting to that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So he is actually the God of this world and people are deceived and don't know that they're deceived, that they're following the gospel. But I think a lot of these false prosperity preachers do know that. And they just suppress that knowledge. And, you know, they are, they are deceived and deceiving. Well, they after a while, you have to deceive yourself for a while. So I'll finish that next point. Next week, I'm going to go get the last will and testament of Timothy, uh, of Paul to Timothy. And I think it's going to be exactly my point that we're going to crucify the prosperity gospel. And we're going to bring this the true gospel life of repentance and faith, humility, humbleness, esteeming others better than loving others better than That's the real gospel. And then I think it's absent in that my apology for those who have had to receive this poisonous gospel from our false teachers. Uh, God have mercy on their soul. That's, that, that's all I can say. Mm -hmm. Sir, would you close for me? Holy Father, we come to you now thanking you and praising you, Father, for the hope you've given us precious and magnificent promises you've given us so 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 many in your, in your word, Father. We thank you so much for Jack and his ability and his desire to bring the truth of the gospel to all of us. And we do pray, Father, for those who have been deceived by the prosperity gospel that you would uh, use us, use people who know the truth of, of your gospel about the death, ground, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Prick our hearts, Father, to try to save those who have been deceived. Prick their hearts to be receptive to the truth of your love. We thank you for each one who is here. We thank you for 
Now you're growing each one of us, Father. We pray that you help each one of us to be patient with others. Because none of us grows as fast as we want to, or as fast as, sure, as fast as we want other people want us to. You know, Father, we pray that you bless our, bless our congregation. May we be known by our love for one another, Father. That people would know that we are disciples of your Son, Father. May we bring glory to his name. That he would glorify you. Please help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, Father. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. 